Welcome back to the Alan Nathan Show. I'm your guest host today, John Hayward, Deputy National Security Editor at Breitbart News. What does Kamala Harris think about fracking? Well, that is one of the great unsolved mysteries of the universe right now. Scientists and philosophers are putting their heads together, trying to figure out exactly what she's going to do if she gains the power to ban the fracking industry. She has, in the past, said that she would ban it entirely the instant she has the power to do so. But now, because she's trying to be competitive in the swing state of Pennsylvania, she suddenly says she's had a change of heart. And in fact, she insists she's never talked about banning fracking, even though she is on record doing so. Here with us to try to untangle all of this is Andre Belovo, Senior Manager of Energy Policy, Energy Policy sorry, at the Commonwealth Foundation. Welcome to the Alan Nathan Show. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Well, maybe you can uh, help me figure this out where Kamala stands on fracking, because I thought it was an amazing moment at the presidential debate when she insisted she's never been in favor of banning fracking and has always supported it. And the person to whom she was speaking was a biased debate moderator who was the very same guy moderating the debate when she said she would ban fracking the instant she had the power to do it. Yeah, it's been interesting to watch this uh, evolution, this flip-flopping that uh, Kamala Harris has been having on on fracking. Uh, you know, we she has clearly in the past said that she would ban fracking. Now uh, we're hearing she's in favor of it. Uh, but, you know, what I've been telling people is like, look, it's it's almost unimportant where she stands on fracking because she the energy policies of the last four years that she is celebrating and she celebrated on the debate stage the other night, uh, it's death by a thousand cuts to the American energy industry. So you can accomplish all that you want to do to end the oil and gas industry and destroy the American energy industry. You can do that a thousand different ways without even having to touch fracking at all. And they've done that with the Inflation Reduction Act, which has poisoned our energy markets away from reliable energy and towards intermittent unreliable energy that's also raising electric costs. Been the Biden Harris EPA that through their draconian regulations and rules trying to take down reliable power plants and forcing closures, which is uh, creating a potential for a grid reliability crisis. And they paused our LNG, or liquid natural, liquid natural gas exports. Uh, so again, the record is clear, and it's a death by a thousand cuts to the American energy industry, whether she's flip-flop on fracking or not. Now, your group, uh, the Commonwealth Foundation, has a report called A New Vision for Energy that talks about how Pennsylvania can lead the way in energy production. And reading through that report, it's clear that the opposite is true. If fracking is banned, Pennsylvania's economy is going to come down in ruins. Everything that you say is good that could happen in the future is going to be bad if Kamala Harris gets in office and pulls the plug. That's right. I mean, obviously, a ban on fracking would be bad, but it's, it's more than that. It's, I mean, everything that has already happened the last four years the end of exports uh, of our LNG, the Biden EPA closing down the reliable power plants and, uh, and the tax credits in the IRA, all of these policies, the record is clear the last four years, one bad policy after another. And if the flip-flopping of fracking isn't true and there's a fracking ban, that's the icing uh, on the cake. And absolutely, we have a new report out now that shows a clear vision for energy policy with uh, Pennsylvania not only being the keystone state, but being the keystone for American energy security. And we hope that these are policies that other states will look at and try to replicate and we need robust federalism because we're certainly not getting clear direction from washington dc on american energy security so it's going to take uh, the people's representatives in their states and their state legislatures to put forward market-oriented strategies that are actually going to bring about american energy security and not energy poverty which is what we're seeing from the biden harris administration last four years and from the environmental left more broadly it has been an article of faith on the environmental left and among Democratic politicians for some years that they can stomp on the energy energy pretty, pretty hard, you know, because everybody's going to fall in love with green energy. Everybody's going to fall in love with electric cars, and they're not going to want fossil fuels anymore. So who cares if we beat up the fracking industry today? It's not going to matter that much longer. And that's not what's happening at all. The electric vehicle industry is an unmitigated disaster, and in places around the country, Americans are increasingly turning away every time they have a choice, away from this green energy stuff and back to fossil fuels and reliable forms of energy that work. That's right, and if they think people are going to buy into these things, then why do you have to mandate them? Why are you mandating EVs? Why are uh, you know Democrats and environmental leftists across the country pushing to mandate uh, renewables? Uh, why do you need tax credits to boost up, uh, you know, things like solar and wind? If they're so great, the market should be moving in that direction and consumers 
uh, and businesses should want them. But of course, we know that's not true. So they need government central planning. They need subsidies uh, in order to boost these things up. Uh, they need mandates. And all they're doing is mandating our way towards a grid reliability crisis and increasing our, elect- uh, our electric costs. Uh, we need to just get these regulations and mandates out of the way, let the market drive our energy production, our energy costs, and we know where that's going to lead us. It's going to lead us towards reliable energy sources and not towards uh, sources that are going to lead us to higher costs and going to kill jobs. Uh, We need energy abundance in the United States, and that's uh, certainly not what we're going to get from so-called green or net zero policies. I notice there's also a growing awareness of the environmental damage from so-called green energy. It's not nearly as clean as we were led to believe. And for one thing, you've got communities that are objecting to having giant wind farms built in their backyards, and those things kill birds Mm -hmm. and stuff. But also, it seems like over the last year, there have been a rash of stories about solar panels, how they degrade and they release toxins into the environment. And somehow nobody noticed this until like 12 months ago. And it's now (laughs) becoming a big story that these aging solar farms are actually environmental catastrophes. Right. Well, and the land use that they take up is, is ridiculous. I mean, what you can do in a one square mile footprint, one square miles with a nuclear uh, plant, you, it would take you almost 15.6 square miles of, of solar. So, I mean, you're taking up uh, valuable agricultural lands. You're taking up valuable uh, natural beauty, uh, littering it with these solar panels that work less than 25% of the time because they rely on the externalities of when the uh, sun is shining or in the case of wind, when the wind is blowing. Uh, so it makes, so not only is it, uh, you know, taking up valuable land use, but it's less reliable. And we can do this on smaller, uh, smaller areas, again, with nuclear power or with natural gas or even uh, with, with, with coal. And, you know, the, again, the so-called green energy, whether it's the wind turbines or the solar panels, they're, they're carbon intensive to make. And it requires the very fossil fuels and petroleum products to make those uh, renewables uh, that they want to ban in the first place. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, prophecy of just uh, poverty, uh, degrowth, and deindustrialization fundamentally. It's not about the environment with these these net zero policies. It's about something far, far deeper, and I would argue far more uh, sinister. It's a political agenda, not an environmental one. Where are we at with nuclear power? Obviously, it is a clean energy source. Nobody wants to call it that, but it is. And many serious engineers have pointed out there's just no way to make it to the kind of transition they're talking about in electric vehicles, as the eye can see, without nuclear. And yet the environmental movement is severely allergic to the idea of building nuclear plants, and the regulatory hurdles are quite formidable. That's right. Well, I mean, it is the most reliable carbon-free emitting source that we have. So if if your number one goal is to reduce carbon emissions, I mean, nuclear power should be a no-brainer if you want to make sure that you do do it in a way that's going to keep the lights on and keep our, our grid online. But, I mean, our biggest problems with it is, is government red tape and regulation that is absolutely preventing uh, the, the build-out of our nuclear fleet. We're closing down nuclear power plants when we should be renewing their licenses. Uh, they can absolutely stay online. So, if, you know, we need, we need nuclear power, but really we need reliable power, and that's going to include everything from nuclear, natural gas, coal, and we need it all. We need more power, not less. Andre Belavo, Senior Manager of Energy Policy at the Commonwealth Foundation. Thanks for joining us today.